Welcome to Meditation and Aliens with Doro and Matt, a webcast that explores everything we currently know about the truth about aliens, human history, reality, consciousness, and the role meditation can do to help us understand all these things, and how we might all work together to build the best world possible for all beings, human or non-human alike. Meditation and Aliens is hosted by me, Matt Reddy. I'm an amateur ufologist. I have a degree in philosophy. I'm the creator of HiveOne.net. I'm also an elected public hospital commissioner in Jefferson County, Washington. Each week, I am joined by Doro Kiley, longtime meditator, meditation teacher, and an experiencer with many stories, and life coach extraordinaire. You can find more about Doro at her website, creationcoach.com. Now, on to the show. And here we are again. How are you doing, Dora? Oh my goodness, I'm doing great. You know, I'm feeling the buzz of this full moon and all this uh, energy between the sun and the earth. And yeah, it just feels electrified right now. So um, I don't quite know what to do with all this frenetic energy, but I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> How are you doing, Matt? I'm good. I'm good. Uh, my. Uh... My wife is on a small trip, and so I'm like by myself at my house, just uh, you know, doing my own thing, research, writing, stuff like that. So excellent, excellent. And you had a class this week, right? With uh, with the institute, the um, yeah, sorry, with the, the name. Farsight Institute, yeah, Farsight. And Daniel Sheehan. So I got uh, I got I got. I think it'll be our weekly update on the latest lecture on ET studies. <laughs> Now, clarify for me, is Sheehan part of the Farsight, or is that a different setup? I'm yeah, not... Daniel Sheehan is a, a famous civil rights lawyer, oh. uh, and he's been involved with the Iran-Contra Iran affair, the Pentagon Papers. He's, he's done a lot of fighting against the Pentagon and CIA over the years. Um, he is Lou Elizondo's lawyer, and he is the creator of the... Uh, the Farsight Institute, which has a, a mission of trying to be the a, a public policy advocacy group for disclosure. And and also, uh, he made it really clear in yesterday's class, also figuring out a way to establish appropriate diplomatic relationships with whoever these NHI are. And, and that's what the class yesterday was all about, was uh, really got into different dimensions of how this could work depending on what the truth is, whatever the real reality is of what's been going on. Yeah. And what is the website for that, uh, the school that you're in right now, giving classes? That's the Farsight Institute is the name sorry, of it? Sorry, sorry. Did I say the Farsight? I said, it's the New Paradigm Institute. Oh, it, okay. Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay, so uh, that's the uh, website, right? Yeah, the New Paradigm Institute, that's the Daniel Sheehan thing. Uh, and it's associated with uh, Ubiquity University. Um for uh, this uh, class and uh, anyone can sign up to work on uh, this uh, a certificate in extraterrestrial studies. And uh, it's, it involves, I got it. I think I have it clear that it involves eight courses and this is the, uh, the first course taken. And um, you're in, you're, you're in the first course and it took your third class. Is that, or yeah, I think it was the fourth class yesterday. Oh, right. Um, and then, uh, yeah, let me see if four, four week class four. Yeah. And then the next class is also by Daniel Sheehan, which is really going deeper into the facts, history, law, politics of UFO and UAP. Um, and then there's two courses that, uh, Richard Dolan teaches, um, each of these, uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm looking at this. So maybe that was the last course i'm gonna have to look and see like do i need to register for the next one but after you do these eight courses you're able to get two certificates one from the new paradigm institute and one from um ubiquity university basically in et studies and i think after the eight courses you can then write a paper to apply for uh, a master's degree in et studies i love that i love yeah. that <laughs> yeah so i'm gonna <laughs> I think I'm going to go that full uh, track. Um, but yeah, I got details on that to uh, 
certainly talk about. Um, so, so details on your class yesterday, right? Is yeah. that what we're going to jump into today? Oh boy. I mean, I definitely, I, I think it'd be, be fun to share. Yeah. Um, I don't really have anything new on the, the activism front in the, uh, world of disclosure you know it seems like they are building up to some sort of another hearing but uh but yeah so i got that class the only other thing uh we mentioned a couple weeks ago that we're going to get an interview with uh yemi uh from the farsight institute which is a remote viewing uh group, a citizen-led remote viewing organization founded by Courtney Brown that does these deep dive studies using multiple remote viewers on all sorts of questions related to human history, aliens, uh, what they're doing, where they come from, you know, all that all sorts good of stuff. Events. And yeah. so, so we're scheduled for that on the uh, two weeks out now? From uh, we don't have the date set. We had to reschedule uh, due to travel. Um but uh, I think we we were targeting um, a day in a few weeks from now. So, right. So we okay. have that, and uh, oh, and I wrote a I wrote and put out a couple of essays uh, this week on Twitter about this uh, out this stuff out. <laughs> You mean um, a kind of summary of what you've been learning or what what were you posting? Let me see if I can. Uh... Is it stuff we're going to be covering today? Oh, it's uh, it basically it was a I mean, it's kind of in line with what the, the New Paradigm Institute mission is. You know, it's it's basically an essay. Um, it's it's titled a, a call for human sovereignty and self-determination. Basically, it's a. It's a, it's just a little essay to humanity saying we have to start facing the reality that UFOs are absolutely real and there's some sort of alien uh, presence here. And it's basically setting up a, um, you know, that the way we should talk about this is to recognize that, you know, all the legal systems of Earth and even the existence of the United States and um, uh, all nations and all laws might be just a... I call that in my essay, that's framework one. That's our known framework. But I think there's a very good chance that the aliens have framework two, which is their legal system, their legal framework. And and I have a sense it's most likely they see the entire earth as something existing within their framework. Like probably at the simplest terms, they probably they probably are some sort of laws that govern alien species and they the simplest thing would be they probably say that Earth is within the territory of one or maybe, you know, it's maybe it's split between a couple species. But let's just for simplicity's sake, they probably I think in their framework, they probably see Earth as within the territory of a species of alien. Just like if you live in a city in North Korea, you know, you live on Earth and there's laws. But if you live in a city in North Korea, you're governed by the laws of North Korea, which is they can do whatever they want because you're within their framework. Right. And, and so that's, I think, and so in my essay, I just want to, you know, I sort of point out, we have to recognize we're probably within framework two of the aliens. And then, but within that, once we recognize that there is a framework that the aliens operate in, we can now use that framework. We just need to target it. And so in the essay, I say, um, we need to, immediately make a declaration to everyone that can hear us that we are um that we have the right to self-determination and i could read just a little bit it, but um, yeah and this is something that you had come up with that you posted yeah. on x Twitter. yeah I, I i came up with the rough ideas and then i worked with you know chat J, chat gpt and claude ai to help polish it up and went back and forth a few times um so yeah it's a uh, so at some point in the essay, I wrote, uh, with this in mind, the author offers the following immediate declaration on behalf of all humanity. And this I call the Declaration of Human Sovereignty and Freedom from Existing Hidden Agreements. Say, we the people hereby declare as a self-evident truth that human beings have the right to self-determination. We are free-thinking beings, and we have the right to know if any non-human intelligence or other members 
of group two. Group two is any any of the we're group one, all known humans are group one. Group two is the others, the non-human intelligence, the alien civilizations. If any we have the right to know if any non-human intelligence or other members of group two currently exist and operate on or in the vicinity of Earth in any capacity. We have the right to know if any treaties, laws, or agreements are currently in place between any humans and any member of Group 2. And we have the right to the immediate nullification and renegotiation of all terms of any such treaty. All humans have the right to personal autonomy, and our minds, bodies, and spirits must not be violated in any way with, by any being without our express written consent. We demand that all members of Group 2 immediately cease all activities that may currently be underway without the full and transparent knowledge of the collective human species on Earth today. We invite all members of Group 2 to openly and peacefully reveal themselves to all of humanity so that we might begin to openly and peacefully craft a harmonious path of coexistence for all beings in which all have the opportunity for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's powerful. Well, yeah. you've put it out there. So if they're out there and listening, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so then I got, uh, yeah. So I got, I don't know, there's a, I'll, I'll just finish the sort of the summary of the little essay. Okay. Um, so then, um, so then I, and then I, I list uh, the proactive measures we can take. Um, and the first is redefining individual allegiance and this is my sort of like my ad i advise people that you know you might want to stop saying things like the pledge of allegiance because i i believe that they the way these aliens get to feel um like they have legal rights is when we pledge allegiance to the flag and to the united states of america we are pledging allegiance to a legal entity that under their system, you know, that transfers our allegiance to them. Mm -hmm. And it's, and so I think it's important. We just stop, stop thinking that, you know, you know, stop pledging allegiance to your country or your nation or your religion, because it's, I think it's part of the legalistic trick and part of breaking their hold is we need to break their legal rights in the view of their own system so that, you know, even in their own laws and by the view of other alien species who might not be um, hostile or might not be as, um, yeah, that, that we, we need to like start to create it legally. They do not have a right to continue to operate in secret and manipulate things as anyways. And then yeah. I go on to a few other things in there. Like we need to cease all military action, demand the truth, the records of the JFK assassination and UFOs and uh, things like that. But anyways, that's a little, essay i put out so, there on twitter. so if people want to review that they go to your uh your twitter account what what is your address your handle there yeah at meditation matt on twitter slash x right I put it out there and then i and yeah that's one of the things i put out this week and um yeah well, go, and then, I tell you, go, ahead. go ahead i want to i want to tell you what i've been doing too sure, real okay quick. and it go just for take, it. it just takes second i've been playing with chat gpt and um, I'm trying to ask it to help envision a better social governing structure that would be usable if things began to collapse. And uh, I wanted, Ch I'm asking ChatGPT to, to use uh, some suggestions that have been outlined in, um, you know, this guy, Joan Givers, who, if I'm pronouncing that right, put out a put out a TED talk called The Four Pillars of Decentralized Society. So I'm asking ChatGPT to take those concepts, and I made sure that, that ChatGPT knew what those were, the four pillars of a decentralized society. And then I said, incorporate these modern technologies that he's talking about, which includes, you know, cryptocurrency and blockchain technologies, combining that with the Iroquois Confederacy, mm. which was the inspiration behind the development of the American Constitution originally. That's where Ben Franklin got some of the best ideas. So when you put those two together, um, 
ChatGPT ended up coming up with some really excellent ideas. Yeah. Mm. So to word my, my question was, can you help me envision a creative way to incorporate Joanne Giver's idea for decentralized society in combination with the basic governing concepts of the Iroquois Confederacy, also known as the Six Nations Confederacy or the Haudenosaunee Confederacy? And then, holy smokes, ChatGPT just went went on. Boy, yeah, I've got a lot here. <laughs> <laughs> It said, uh, combining John Giever's idea with a decentralized society and the governing concepts of the Iroquois Confederacy could lead to a fascinating exploration of decentralized governance rooted in indigenous principles. And then it just goes on and on and on about how to do it. <laughs> so mm. it's good to be thinking about these things because if uh, if a good section of humanity ends up really declaring sovereignty we have to have some some structure to go on something to follow something to envision so yeah yeah it it kind of starts to overlap with uh, this is it, during the class yesterday with uh, Daniel um he sort of went over the different situations we might find ourselves and and the sort of the worst case scenario is that our political and governing systems on earth are so incredibly corrupt and broken at a fundamental level, you know, that we have to, you know, it's sort of like, can we within these systems use these systems to fix them, to make them better, to make them serve humanity, or do we have to um, step outside of them in some way and really like start over and, and, and rebuild something those are those are very two very important questions that's that's kind of why i was asking about the iroquois confederacy i have a neighbor here who is a scholar she is a professor of indigenous cultures um focused in the americas north and south but i i asked her one day over tea i said if if the whole social structures around the world caved in what would be the best suitable structure to first use to, in order to start rebuilding and she did not hesitate she said the iroquois confederacy because that's what benjamin franklin used as a template for the american constitution so that would be a good one to to put in there because it does include uh, you know a lot of morality and how to come to consensus votes and um yeah i don't I, i'm not a scholar by any means but i felt like that sort of puts a foot in the door, you know, gives us yeah. some place to start. Yeah. It's just, a, it's just sort of wonder what the path would be. Um, I don't know. I don't know. So, but, so uh, yeah. Curious about what your, your class was. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he, let's see. So he went over you know, so he was going over the the possible realities of the political situation, um, and let's see. Um, I mean, he was sort of exploring how does this UFO disclosure fit with all the traditional worldviews that exist on Earth, with the and the you know, is it going to break down in the Republican Democratic sort of world or on a global scale? Scale is it going to? How does it fit with the the global um fight between the the state capitalist sort of movement and the democratic socialist movement which was kind of the two things he said that were majorly at work on earth right now mm. how does it fit in the whole nato versus russia and china situation are they you know are they is there some opposition there or is there a secret you know coordination and agreement between nato and china and russia that supersedes everything that we see um these are his questions that yeah out there okay yeah. yeah good questions and um you know and like uh you know how should or will disclosure happen will you know and or what do we want you know do we want a hundred percent disclosure or do we want some sort of partial disclosure um is there part of the truth that should be kept hidden from the general population you know, should we be fighting for 100% disclosure or should we be trying to figure out where is the appropriate line to draw for some reason? 
or safety or something. And then it starts to get good. Uh, he says, what degree of change in the earth power structures, the current earth power structures is just necessary for us to e do any sort of ET UFO disclosure? Um, what degree of change is unavoidable? Uh, and what degree of change in the earth current power structures will be completely unacceptable to those in the current earth power structures? Because <laughs> yeah. that means they'll fight us every step of the way as we yeah. try to get that disclosure. So that's, um, and then he's like, so another question is what degree of amnesty should we be ready to offer to those who have been lying and covering this up over the decades, you mm -hmm. know, and, um, you know, if there's lying to Congress, there's probably been murders, there's been or assassinations, there's been theft, you know, what level of accountability or consequences should we be expecting or pushing for or, and, uh, you know, what level of amnesty should we offer in order to help make this happen? Yeah. And, wow. you know, he, yeah, he's just, and so then he goes, uh, you know, should we be figuring out how to craft a political reconciliation process, you know, for like in South Africa, they did a truth and reconciliation process after the end of apartheid. And, uh, we might, you know, have some sort of similar process. Will it involve you know, reparations or the dis, he called it disgorgement of benefits, you know, if Lockheed Martin and, uh, you know, other groups have been just enriching themselves off yeah. of this cover up and lies, should we be prepared to force them to surrender some of the wealth and benefits they've accrued? Mm. Um, then, yeah, that's I'll, I'll just like keep questions. Yeah, yeah it's it's like, these sense. are yeah, I mean, it's great. I mean, that's why it's like it's so clear. This is this is such a, a perfect subject for really serious academic discussion. You know, it's really it's basically, you know, the creation of a think tank for how do we handle this as a matter of policy and process for humanity. Right. Um, you know, he talks about uh, if we are going to, you know, if we are going to start negotiating with aliens, not another civilization or multiple civilizations openly, you know, we don't have our, our world is not unified under one government. So how can humanity negotiate with aliens? If we aren't under one government, are some governments going to have to surrender some level of sovereignty? Um, you know, he points out the United Nations doesn't really function for anything serious because it's it's not actually a unified body of earth countries they have the you know uh the security council can veto anything and that's why they can't you know pass a ceasefire and against israel and gaza and other places they so it's like you know, the united nations yeah. couldn't really negotiate for and all they're humanity. also being heavily lobbied by the um wef group you know mm -hmm. they so there's a lot of influence coming from corporate you know so so the un is not what it used to be i don't think yeah i'm not sure it, it ever was yeah. what it what we dreamt for it to be right. i mean that sort of goes to the wef the bilderberg group they may be you know part of the basically the the secret world government that's been controlling earth and, and that's sure. part of yeah. that's part of the question he's like if that's the case you know if there is a that's sort of like two dimensions to that. He's like, if there is a secret group that is the secret authority of Earth, that sort of goes back to the framework thing I said in my essay. You know, if if the aliens have their own legal framework, and within that framework, the ultimate authority on Earth right now of humans is some secret group like the Bilderberg group. So if if we're group one and the aliens are group two, I call this secret authority on Earth of humans group one. E, I call it E because of the elite. He, everyone's saying they're, they're the elite. So group yeah. one E is the elite humans. That might be the group that technically from the aliens point of view actually rules earth. And they are, you know, they just, they they do their thing behind the scenes to manipulate politicians, to, to decide who goes to war. Maybe they even decide how wars are going to end. It's all part of their scheme for just manipulating the population. Yeah. But if that's the case, that, that creates a really complicated situation for us to figure out a way to legally unseat this group one E because they're not elected. They're designated by,
by the aliens, you know, they're like some council of people that control earth. I mean, so, but we don't know, we don't know for sure if that's the setup, but if, you know, that's, that's one possibility that could be the reality we're living in. There's this secret government group one E another possibility, you know, let's say that if that doesn't exist, it might, there might be just secret, a secret treaty between earth nations and the aliens but it's still a treaty that exists within our framework is a treaty between say, you know, somehow the U S government and the aliens say um, that's a possibility. But, you know, he, he said in the, you know, the thing is it, it's hard to see how a treaty that was not ratified by the Senate could possibly be legal under our system, under our laws. Cause you have to, but I guess he, that's what he explained in the last class. There's probably some legalistic argument he could claim that, the executive branch has the right to uh, negotiate treaties without Congress or the Senate. And so they might might claim they've been in 100 years of negotiation over a treaty agreement with the aliens. And that's why they haven't had to tell the Senate or something. But Wow. <laughs> this goes deep. <laughs> this is deep. And he is an attorney, right? So yeah. he's he's, uh, he's kind of looking at this from, wow. Yeah, he's, he's trying to see a legal... You know what are the legal methods? Because that's his tech. That's what he's been doing for years. He uses yeah. the court system and lawsuits in order to pressure the system to to do right and to fix things. But you know he's he's thinking of how to work within the system, the legal system, which he sees right. that's his that's his uh, that's his medium of choice. Yeah, I'm sure he's trying to preserve it too, and maybe he sees it being threatened. You know. Trying to keep it functional. <laughs> well, it's, I mean, it's, you know, he says, you know, it, it just, it might not be possible. It might be that our legal system, I mean, and that's the, what I see as an activist, you know, it's the legal system won't help you if the legal system is corrupt. If the laws that have been passed serve the oppressors, then the laws no longer serve us. You know, the, the laws used to say that it was legal to own slaves, used to, you know, say that it was legal to, have segregation and so i mean if the laws are written in a way that oppress people then there's no point in trying to use the legal system it mm. you have to you have to you know disobey the laws you know you have to have civil disobedience or more and uh but it's you know it's not it's worth a try it's worth a try to you know move on every level wow Oh my goodness. So yeah, this, this goes, uh, gets very involved. Um, yeah. I mean, all the governments, how do you get everybody on, on the same page to be represented by somebody they agree on? Big, 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 big picture there. Um, yeah. So what else you got? Well, I mean, I just have a tangent about this group 1E, um, okay. the secret government. So I had this idea while I was, um, while I was listening to this, so imagine there is, let's imagine that the aliens do recognize some, there's this, there's this legendary story of the group of 300, that there's 300 people that were designated at some point, and they are the, like, I don't know, I can't remember the origin of how far back this story goes, but that, that somehow there's an elite class of humans, and their families throughout history have been actually the elite leaders of Earth, and that there's 300 humans that are the uh, secret authority government of earth. And I, so we call this group one E and let's just say from the aliens perspective, that's the group that they recognize as the authority, the representatives of humanity. So if that was the case, you know, then I would say like, just like with my essay, you know, I would now, and I might probably write something like this. We need to put out a declaration that says to the aliens, we, the humans, immediately call for you to allow us to select the 300 humans that represent us. And whoever you have on your list of these 300 humans that you think represent us, they are immediately, we are rejecting them. And we demand the right to elect a new 300 people <laughs> that we choose. You know, I think, because if, you know, I mean, it's it's sort of like, it's just immediately going to the power source. The, it's the, if the aliens, if they agreed, okay, you know, we can allow humanity to vote their new 300 rulers. They don't, then it could immediately like take the Bilderberg group and all of them out of commission. They'd immediately <laughs> be unseated. 
Good. And he's like, yeah, we're going to elect our, our own leaders, you know, let us choose our leaders. If we have, to. if you insist we live under the rule of 300 authoritarian, some authoritarian group, then let us choose our own leaders. Mm, mm. Something like that, like is, you know, I, I like to look at like what big swings could possibly just completely change the dynamic. Um, Bitcoin. Oh yeah. Well, <laughs> Bitcoin, would do well, it, Bitcoin yeah. it frees yeah. us because, you know, the, the federal reserve, is just, you know, it's just, it's probably controlled by whoever this secret world government is, and they just get to print money. They just right. get to print money out of thin air. And it has never been more clear to me that the ability to print money, you know, print more US dollars is a secret way of taxing people. It's just, <laughs> yeah. by when they print 10% more currency, they're basically just stealing 10% of our wealth from us, 10% of your bank account. And they don't have to pass a tax to do that. They don't have to pass Congress. They just get to do it. Yeah. And it's like, it's so obvious. Once you realize that it's possible to have a uh, something like Bitcoin where they can't print more, you cannot print more Bitcoin. There's 21 million and, and probably 5 million of that is lost because people in the early days didn't realize it was going to succeed. So they, they didn't take care of it. Yeah. So there's, yeah, so Bitcoin is such a key step in freeing us from the ability of these secret world governments to use printing money to just control Earth. But then it also, it created a technology, you know, because it's uncensorable technology, we can use it for media, we can use it for communication, we can use it for voting, and that will allow us to create, you know, a decentralized uncensorable system for us to govern ourselves and yeah i mean that's like yeah, that's what we have to do i mean you know if we're saying we want our own sovereignty you know that those people do not represent all of humanity uh we have to know what we're talking about what do you, what's sovereignty what what are we what how can we do that yeah. so that's that's why i'm working with chat gpt on this so yeah, yeah. bitcoin is going to be a big part of that picture yeah yeah, well, the key, I mean, let's just say the aliens were like, okay, fine, you can elect 300 new people to be your leaders, and we will recognize that as legit. Then the problem is we don't, the way our voting system happens right now involves a lot of trust of the governing system to oh, use. Oh, yeah, the, the, no, it, to, couldn't. it would have to be on a whole different kind of a blockchain or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah blockchain based voting and yeah mm -hmm. it's actually yes. michael saylor is this huge bitcoin advocate he's the ceo of microstrategy um but he talks he I, I saw a great interview with him recently where he really talked about how this is spreading into other systems and he really eloquently explained how bitcoin was the block the genius of that was an uncensorable ledger and we're using it for money and property with bitcoin but we can now expand that to all sorts of property and to voting and decision making Contracts, but the key yeah yeah but mm -hmm. but the key is you need an identity system you need a way to know that it's one person one vote and and they don't we don't quite have a standard for that yet we don't have a standard identity system that is that has really worked so far on the blockchain there's a number of competing initiatives but it's it's the only thing that's stopping us from really using the blockchain to vote on anything we want, whether it's your opinion on movies, your uh, who you want to vote for president, who you want to vote for leadership. And so that's an area I'm really watching carefully because with the software platforms I'm building, like, you know, it's like you, you need identity because it's so easy in the digital world to create multiple identities, multiple wallets, multiple addresses for yourself. And right. that sort of, that totally undermines the whole idea of voting. Mm. in a fair way so yeah but you said there were some some think tanks out there working on this idea yeah what, what's in the pipeline do you have any examples well nothing has nothing has become the standard one but one that might actually be cut reveal itself as um a legit one and this is what so sailor mentioned that so you can on twitter on x you can pay to get sort of like a a verified identity on there and but that doesn't work for the world. That's just one software platform. Right. Um, but, you know, another one that might actually work is Coinbase because hmm. Coinbase gives everyone cryptocurrency addresses. And that's what you need for the blockchain 
um, you know, voting is you, everyone needs an address, but then you need someone doing identity verification. And that's what Coinbase does as a financial institution. It, it forces you to, you know, reveal your identity. And so I, and Coinbase is considering sort of really enabling their individual accounts to really take part in these blockchain applications on Solana and Ethereum and all these other blockchains. And if, if they really open that up, it should be so easy to just use Coinbase identities as a, a really a pretty solid um, form of identity for people. And it, again, it might not work for, you know, all the way through Russia and China, they might not trust Coinbase as a, yeah. as a vehicle, but once you have a crypto address, you know, anyway, I, I think that's a possibility. I think Coinbase identity might be, might really help be a step in the right direction so that, yeah very quickly, every human, at least in the US, would have a verified um, identity and, and verified uh, blockchain addresses. I guess the only other thing, the problem with that is corporations can get Coinbase addresses. So you'd have to, but you'd be relying on Coinbase to differentiate a real human from a corporation. But um, Well, the important thing is, is we're putting it out there. We're really asking the universe for the perfect solution. Yeah. So. And I, and, well, I have my own, I have my own solution that I'm going to um, implement uh, or I've been sort of thinking about for a while. Oh um, boy, you going to share it? Yeah, well, it's based and, and there is a, I can't remember their name anymore. There was another group that claimed to be trying to do exactly this system, but it basically would be like, you know, so like it could start with just you and me. Like, I know I'm real. I know you're real. We each get a, a crypto address and now we basically grow by i would give you know you say somewhere between 10 and 50 tokens that are for confirming the identity of between 10 and 50 other people and you would just and so i would like take one of my tokens and give it to you and it would be that would be my way of saying i know i trust that you are a real person that you only have one identity on the system and then you would do the same thing. You would give me one of your tokens and then we'd have the ability to let's just say 10 other people, we can send a token to them to say we trust them and that they're real. And when you you know, trust 10 other people, they each get 10 tokens and they can do the same thing. And so it basically, it, it starts to web out very quickly you know, in an exponential form, just like uh, when it grows like this. If, and what happens is it would create a web. So coming out from just starting with you and me trusting each other, you eventually have a web of like 100,000 people in this trust network. And and some people would have multiple, they would have more trust because you could, they don't have to be just trusted once. You know, I have 10 friends, they might send, you know, a token back to me. And, you know, so some people might have like 100 or 1,000 trust tokens from other people. And all this would be recorded. So if, and so how do you trust, I mean, you're talking about you can trust somebody who you've actually met, somebody in your family, somebody, a friend that you have seen face to face, somebody who you can physically interact with, you know, they're not a, a bot or a artificial yeah. intelligence. Yeah, so it's then, basically okay. just, it's, it's yeah. almost like in your town, you know, it's, it'd be a way, you know, so when someone voted or said something, you would see, oh, that person is trusted by 200 people and we would know what who which 200 people that was and so if someone did lie and got caught they were trying to game the system they had, say they had multiple accounts they were trying to have two identities and you that was revealed you would be able to immediately see exactly what other people were connected to that and so it would be like it, it wouldn't be a perfect system but it would be robust and based upon like human to human uh, you know, basically human trust, just like in a town, yeah. if you go to a town and you meet some guy named Joe, you can just ask around and get an idea of what the actual trust level of, is of this Joe person. Yeah. Um, this is what a, it would, it would sort of be a, yeah. I think that's a brilliant idea. You know, if, if there, if it's got, you know, problems, those are just tweaking the problems. You know, I, I think that's a really great basic place to start. Yeah. Yeah, I, I do too. And I've been thinking about, I was going to try to build it. There was another company that uh, that was basically had the same model and they were trying to do a decentralized ID 
system. But, um, and I even tried to contact them to get it, uh, to use it on Hive One, uh, the social media platform I built. But they, uh, my developers could never figure out how to work with them. And they didn't seem to respond to us when we asked for help. And I, I don't know if that's because they, I think, I mean, one of my theories, I looked at their platform and it looked like they already had some group or organization that kind of called themselves something like hive one, or it was like one hive. Mm. And so I think, it, I think they either, I don't know if they just were disorganized and incompetent, or if they felt like they didn't want to work with me because hive one has a similar name to something of theirs. And they thought that was bad or they didn't trust me for that or they just didn't like the confusion of that i don't know but i'm back well, to thinking maybe i just need to I bet there's myself. enough people out there that would be willing to put in some ideas you know create a, a think tank to to yeah. get this off the ground but i think that's a good start yeah yes 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 so let's see um yeah, I mean, it is very relevant. It's really inspiring to be part of this class with the New Paradigm Institute, because at the end of it, he was talking about, like, we need to figure out how to organize as a UFO community and how do we coordinate and what initiatives do we focus on? And this is all totally in line with um, my thinking. Yes. And uh, yeah, if you and go it, through all the classes, when when is it that you think you would get your credentialing? Well, I think each course is four weeks and they're pretty much sequential. So um, I think we got 12 more weeks of classes. Um, I need to, I need to look and see if I need to register uh, for the, the rest of it. And then I have to write a, a master's thesis. And uh, so some of these essays that I'm working on and that I've, you know, might be, I, I have so many ideas for things that I could, you know, <laughs> Do as a focus thesis and then you can go for a full phd um that's great i mean I, I don't see that why i would ever stop this is like just like such such a fascinating though you know it's, it's a fascinating fun interesting you know and seemingly incredibly important topic but then you know part of me is just like how can you i mean it, it's so hard to take a subject seriously if the whole world doesn't believe it's serious, doesn't believe it's real. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you got to not care what people think, you know, just to talk about it. Right. But it's the, the world's the, that people don't take it seriously undermines our ability to deal with it. And so you, you actually, we need the, the world to wake up to that it's serious so that they will help fix it and participate right. in the fixing of it. Otherwise we're just sort of like, banging our heads against the wall and uh yeah and, i mean and also that's like emotionally like intellectually i believe this stuff this is true this is really what's going on behind the scenes but because it's hidden I, a part of me is just like i can't really emotionally take it seriously you know i can't so it's, it's a weird mental position to be in oh yeah yeah, uh, I mean, if I mention it to to some of my family up north, you know, they, <laughs> oh, there she goes again. You know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, that's it's a real uh, stigma. Mm. But I'm just pressing forward, and uh, so I've launched a, uh, a a new thread of uh, a a tactic for trying to do this to try to unify and organize the ufology community activist community and invite members of the cryptocurrency community in to uh, really participate in this and to leverage cryptocurrencies and meme coins in order to uh, try to fight for disclosure and diplomatic peace with aliens. Well, that's interesting. How would you leverage meme coins? Well, you know, people, it's very easy to release a meme coin, a, a crypto token. And so I've decided to create what I'm calling the Alien Disclosure Peace Alliance. And it, what it's going to do, and I created a, um, a cool logo for it. I was working on all day yesterday. And, and what we're going to do is release uh, Alien Disclosure focused meme coins and just launch them and release them. And if 
And if people want to support the movement for disclosure and for figuring out the truth and negotiating peace with whoever these aliens are, they can just buy the coins just as a sort of an act of participating or they can buy them, trade them, whatever. And if, and if the coins, if any of the coins um, grow in market value, then they'll climb up the charts and they'll get press based on that. And so it'll be, um, and there's really no limit to the number of meme coins that we can create. And so, and so each one can have its own sort of message. So I, so I created one, the first one is sort of my test case. And uh, I call it, or it's called Reptilians for Peace is the name of the coin. And the, the symbol of the coin is Lacerta. Uh, and it's on the Solana blockchain. And it's named Lacerta after Lacerta, the reptilian female alien who was apparently interviewed in 1999. Uh, and the transcript of that interview has been floating around the internet. And it... Uh, and and the Farsight Institute did a remote viewing study of the of that interview incident and uh, of La Certa. And according to their study, uh, they, as far as they're concerned, it was real. La Certa is real. She really is a reptil female reptilian alien. And they think, well, I don't know, based on what I took from their studies, she may still be alive. She may still be a leader of at least part of the reptilian aliens. So this meme coin is sort of a it's like uh, it's my attempt at reaching out to the reptilian aliens, openly acknowledging their existence, and also it's sort of a way of subtly saying, I believe there has to be some portion of the reptilian species that is for peace and wants peace with humans, and this coin is targeting however whoever that is, even if it's a very small percent of the reptilians, because everything we hear is they, they seem to be a pretty aggressive species. Um, yeah. <laughs> oh, oh my goodness yeah yes so yeah i created it and i put it out there and uh, no one's really bought it you know i don't i don't really I'm not familiar with the techniques for promoting meme coins but i'm like i'm working through how you're supposed to do it and you know this is the test case and and then i'm gonna you know i'm gonna create a few others so you know like this one has a clear message reptilians for peace and my dream is that you know if there if there are a million reptilians in our solar system you know, maybe, maybe 5%, maybe 1% of them are actually in favor of peace and a way they could, maybe they could, they could actually buy some of this. They could actually, <laughs> it could yeah. be a way for them to participate. And just by buying this coin, they would be saying they support the idea of peace, or at least they could put on, you know, if they're smart, the reptilians would put on the facade of supporting peace. You know, they would buy it just because they'd want humans you know, when they know they get revealed, they want to be able to show, look, yeah, we've been for peace this whole time. Okay. I'm envisioning it just going off the charts. All the reptilians are buying into it. Yeah. And I, you know, and, and the great thing is these, you know, the coins, um, yeah, I can put out all this, all this information with the coin under the description. I made a really long description of it saying, this is not a joke. This is not a, just a way to make money. The purpose of this coin is alien disclosure and revealing the truth about the history of humanity and then figuring out a way to achieve peace and and the money if it actually and so i'm holding back and right now i got about 20 percent of the supply of the coin is held in wallets i control but and so if it takes off i'm just gonna dedicate all that money to this mission <laughs> okay so <clears throat> who knows who know and then you know and this is just the first coin if other people like this idea i mean there's so many people trading meme coins to try to get to get rich you know yeah. so why not combine the fun and excitement of meme coins with an actual fun meaningful mission uh, mission yeah yeah so yeah next one would be et disclosure coins or memes <laughs> et disclosure that's a good yeah. idea that's a nice simple one et disclosure coin <laughs> I have a list of, uh, of, and that actually I think could be part of the fun of it. I'm going to just invite people. What do you want the next coin to be? Like, tell me what you want to name it. What would be the theme of it? And then, you know, we can, you know, that's part of the making these coins successful is building community around them. So I could engage right. the community in voting on the next name and logo. And then we just maybe do one a month 
and just keep on doing it. And then eventually like we'll have like these 10 meme coins and it'll almost tell a story because each one, the name of it will like hit one aspect of the truth that we're trying to get at. Um, Interesting. You could do, you could do one after each class on the, you know, <laughs> uh governments for ets you know yeah. i don't know yeah, yeah lots of creative ideas there yeah now it's and it's not like free you can't do it for free it does cost money to launch each one um i think it costs i think you a minimum of a couple hundred dollars mm. um but really it's more like 500 to a thousand dollars to launch each one with any sort of like uh success mm. but um but anyways, if, you know, if any of them start to become successful at all, that'll, it'll help start funding itself so we can just keep going. Yeah. I watched that, that video and you should put the link below, you know, so people have that video that you sent to me, um, stepping through how to, to do it. This guy created one and launched it. And what was it? Two hours later, he made a million dollars. Yeah. This, this guy launched Hammy. I think it's called H-A-M-I. Uh, yeah. yeah. I don't know. If um i mean it's it's a it's a crazy it's a, it's a it's a crazy thing but you know it also meme the thing that is that makes these meme coins have this potential for success is that they are really they're legit currencies mm -hmm. um, in the sense that once they have their supply locked out there it's it's as secure as uh bitcoin in the sense that the supply can't be changed and you can't duplicate them. And so it's, you know, it's just, they're not going to be, I mean, it's like if a thousand years ago, you know, if any person could create a million copper coins real easily and that's just, and, but they would be um, not only would you create a million copper coins, but you create a million coins that are exact replicas of one another. So they are unique. Say they all have a picture of you on them. But they're also indestructible. They like no one could ever destroy or mess with one, and no one could ever possibly make a duplicate of it. That's the power of what cryptocurrency gives you. And so, you know, it, it's a different world if every person can now create a million copper tokens that are indestructible, of limited supply, and can't be duplicated, and they suddenly start trading them like trading cards. Yeah, it becomes a. It's like a sub ecosystem of financial transactions which um i don't know it's a it's a fascinating phenomenon i don't think it's going away it it's, is uh, fascinating i mean this little area that i uh, live in um is a small community and they they way back in the day it's an old hippie community they they came up with their own uh, currency and it was made out of it, this was way before computers or anything made out of little squares of denim fabric <laughs> and uh, and they were called Floyd script and each one had a value to it and they were actually being traded between the stores and the farmers and <laughs> it was an experiment it was way back when the experiments were big back in the hippie days so <laughs> so yeah different kinds of currencies are are valuable if you can create them so yeah yeah, it's a fascinating, fascinating time. Yeah. So I don't know if aliens use crypto, but um, maybe we'll get them into it. <laughs> well, that's, you know, that's one of my, I think that's a huge question is not only what's their the governing framework, what sort of, what laws do they respect? Do they have any sort of court system, you know, but also do they have a currency? Do they use yeah. money? I mean, if there's multiple alien civilizations, you know, yeah, it's just like you can't just trade for stuff. I mean, they could always trade resources and supplies, but you you need some sort of unit of account to really make trade feasible. And so, I mean, you would think a cryptocurrency would be the perfect solution. I mean, it is the perfect solution for a money system because it's not corruptible, but maybe they just use centralized fiat currencies and they have some sort of inter you know civilization exchanges just like on earth we have currencies and they we have they try to exchange and once in a while one collapses it just doesn't seem that would that would work well for any species that lasts thousands of years they would they would need something like bitcoin that is 
That yeah, is a I don't know. And then I think of Star Trek. You know, they they talk about Earth has you know evolved long past any need for currency, and they have a whole different system. Well, they said that, but if you went to Star Trek Deep Space Nine, um, they had gold-plated latinum was the currency that the Ferengi and... Oh, the Ferengi, yeah. Yeah. So they still, they had something that they were using as gold, you know, like, so it's like they couldn't get away from the fact you, you know, there's always a place where you need to be able to transact. And, yeah. and, and you know, I mean, it's like, and if you don't have currency, that's the weird thing about the Star Trek world. You have no currency. How, who gets to live in the biggest mansion, you know, in the best place on earth if you don't have any sort of money, you know, and who determines, you know, it, like, do you have, does everyone have to work or do you know, like, are you obligated to do five hours of work a day and there's no way to get around that? Cause you don't, no one has extra money to be able to just like goof off and there's no way to get to earn extra hours. So you don't have to work. I mean, it's like, I just don't see how you construct a system that doesn't use money in some way. Um, you know, I, I believe that we're here to see what we can become. And I think if we started at a very young age teaching children to tap into their innate skills and interests and talents and encouraging them to become an artisan, not just, not just a, a cog in the wheel of the society, but to become real artisans. Everybody has a skill. Everybody has something to offer whether it's, you know, cooking or, uh, you know, or teaching math, that, that could be an art form, uh, you know, or, or building tables or whatever. So if everybody was taught from a very early age to, to discover and, and uh, develop their, their skill, their innate talent, what they have a real passion for, then whatever they're building and constructing, you know, that, that could be used as, as a way of, um, exchanging for other goods. I, I mean, it's an old barter system. Um, yeah, I don't know. I get lost in the weeds with this, but yeah, you could do that to a degree, but big international trade, obviously that's not going to be happening. Yeah. We got to start from scratch and rethink how it all could fit together. Well, if we can just, you know, make a way for humans to have a secure decentralized way of just expressing our opinions about everything right. you know if if people could just like every day wake up and say if they wanted to just instantly just record on the blockchain hey i'm planning on voting for you know whoever then you would instead of having the media doing these surveys of just a handful of people and telling us oh looks like you know this person's ahead in the polls and then and then the day of the vote happens and all we have to compare the results from the vote are all these sketchy polls that only asked 500 people. If instead we could record our opinions on the blockchain, so it said, oh, it clearly in my county, this presidential candidate, everyone's already said like 10% more people in this county have said they're going to vote for this candidate. And then we go and vote at the polls. It better match what we've already said. You can't not going to be able to fake it if we already know okay. yeah. what our opinions are. We already mm. record every day our opinions. Yeah. Anyways, if we can just eliminate the control and oppression and then we have sound money, we can start figuring out a better system. Yeah. And our and our leaders that we vote in would be not put there because they have a lot of money, but maybe because they have a lot of wisdom. That would be a good goal. For well, leaders you know, to be wise, not rich. Yeah, it'll it'll help to know if our leaders are actually anything more than just puppets being controlled by some secret group. Right. Um, yeah. 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 Ooh, it's a lot Best there. Times. Well, do we have time for just a couple minutes to feel our feet on the floor and get real for a second? Yeah, let's do a closing meditation. Yeah, we'll make it a real short one. So just think, just remembering that all of this is not clear. It's not very, um, it, it's mostly just ideas, it's concepts, it's evidence coming up, but nothing really solid yet. So we're all just kind of floating around in, in this soup of not knowing for sure much of anything at this point. So in order to stay 
somewhat centered, we need to be able to let go of these anxieties and come back to the moment and put our feet on the floor, breathing in and out. I'm just going to ring a bell just to get a sense of this is here right now. Take a nice deep breath. Just let it all go. Let everything go. The anxiety, the uncertainty, the maybe fear, even the excitement. Let's just come right here, right now. Feet on the floor, butt on the chair. Maybe your hands are in your lap. Let's take a nice deep breath in. And just let it go. When we can come home to ourself in the moment and clear our mind, everything falls into place. It's extremely important to maintain some sense of equilibrium during these conflicting times. Our mind can be so scattered and pulled in different directions. It's important to have an anchor. And the anchor is right in the moment, breathing in and breathing out. It could be in the moment looking around, if you're driving, watching the scenery go by, looking at the clouds, if you're walking, feeling your feet on the ground. These are mindful moments that help keep us stable. This is as close as we can get to what's real. Breathing in and breathing out. Thanks, Matt. Thank you, Dora. Have a great week. You too.